So as Ophelia said, my name is Michaela and I'm a researcher at the University of Leicester. So the Northern Lights have fascinated humans for thousands of years, including myself. And today I really want to talk more about how our understanding of the Northern Lights or the Aurora as we also know them, um, has progressed, um, particularly since the space age and since we've been able to view the Aurora from space. Um, and also, so what we know about them and also how we ultimately want to be able to predict them. So there is a slightly darker side to the aurora, and that is um, space weather. So the, the aurora falls under this kind of umbrella term of space weather. And this is kind of similar to how we have regular weather on Earth, but it's activity which is driven mostly by solar storms and solar activity on the sun. So space weather is this kind of catch-all name for the high energy radiation and particles in near Earth space that can damage or disrupt um, infrastructure and essential services on Earth that we depend on in our day-to-day -day lives. And so a few things that I wanted to highlight, so you can see there's a, a whole host of different um, impacts that we can have, um, but the aurora mostly um, affects the kind of high atmosphere, which we call the ionosphere. And so some of the effects that I wanted to point out um, are, so the high energy particles that cause the aurora to happen. So these high energy particles come in and they interact with uh, oxygen and nitrogen atoms in our atmosphere that can emit light that we see as the aurora. Um, but this kind of high energy particles into the ionosphere can also really disrupt radio wave communication. And so it's kind of like if you think suddenly the ionosphere gets all wobbly and that's where the radio waves tend to propagate along um, and then it makes it very difficult. So we can get degradation in radio signals or complete loss in radio signals as well. And this can really impact um, pilots. Oh, sorry, I don't think my pointer is on. Uh, yeah, so this can be really impactful for pilots uh, and aircraft. So a lot of aircraft depend on radio communications to talk to ground um, and other planes and also things like radar systems so it can affect both kind of commercial flights and military as well um we also have when we have lots of electrons in a highly conductive material like the ionosphere uh, we can also induce currents and these currents can actually also induce currents in our power systems um, and this can cause a lot of difficulties for our power systems and even sometimes failure in our electricity grids. So this all, all sounds a bit um, far-fetched. So has this ever actually happened before? And the, answer is, and the answer is yes. So what happens during a big space weather event? Well, one of the earliest ones we have recorded and the one we like to talk about the most because it was a huge event, is what we call the Carrington event of 1859. And so there was actually an am amateur astronomer who was observing the sun through a telescope. And they noticed that there was this sudden really bright light that came from the sun. It was quite short, um, but it was really, really bright and visible light. And what we think happened was that the astronomer uh, observed an, an X-class solar flare or a solar flare. And this is an intense burst of radiation in, in the X-ray part of the ultraviolet spectrum. Um, and they're often associated with or can also occur um, at the same time as these kind of big solar storms, which are also called coronal mass ejections. And they throw lots of particles and energy out into the solar system. And so in the next few days, what happened after the amateur astronomer observed this event was that there was a lot of disruption to telegraph communications and these were the main methods of communications back in the time um, and there were even fires um, at telegraph stations as well and so it was all to do with kind of induced currents in the systems that caused things to catch fire um, also uh, the northern and southern lights were uh, observed a much further away from the sort of polar regions that we would normally see them at so for example, the Northern 
lights were seen as far south as Cuba and Hawaii. So quite unusual conditions there. Um, the next event that we often talk about is in 1989, in what had mostly an effect in Quebec, the Quebec region of Canada. And so in this event, there was actually a nine hour outage of the electricity supply network. So no electricity across the whole region, um, a complete blackout, no lights, no, no nothing. Um, and it took them a long time to be able to get back, to, to get things back up and running after the solar event. So again, this is uh, currents which are overloading the system. Um, another one, which is the Halloween storm in 2003. So we like to give it these names. So it, the storm occurred around Halloween in the end of October in 2003. And um, by the sort of early 2000s, we're starting to have many more satellites up in space. So both for telecommunications and also for science questions, science missions, um, and lots of other reasons. And so what happened in, in 2003 is that we started to get a loss of satellite communications. So if you think about all the high energy radiation and particles that are being thrown out from the sun, they can kind of disrupt the delicate um, electronics on satellites um, and it can prevent them from being able to communicate with the Earth. Um, it also had local power outages in Sweden as well, but they were quite localized. Another one, um, which actually is a, is a bit of a, um, not fake news, but um, it, it wasn't actually, we were quite lucky. So you might recognize the phrase London 2012, because that is when we held the Olympics in London. Um, and actually, there was a huge space weather event which occurred. Um, we don't possibly around the size of the Carrington event, but we're not really sure. It was a big one anyway. But we were extremely lucky because the space weather event was directed at Earth, but it actually just narrowly missed the Earth. And so we were very lucky. But you can kind of think about, um, it would show you how much disruption it could cause to an event like the Olympics as well. Um, if you've got people, tourists who are not so familiar with London, losing their GPS, for example. Um, you could have disruptions to electricity supply, so would the tube network have to stop? Um, it could really be chaos, and many probably of the Olympic events might have to stop as well if there is no electricity supply. And finally, a much more recent one um, was a storm in 2017. And this, I think, really highlights the kind of secondary impact that a space weather event could have. And so in 2017, there was a solar storm, but independently, so completely separated, there were four hurricanes that also hit the Caribbean islands. So this is kind of hurricane season in Central and South America. And so four hurricanes had hit and there was a solar storm at the same time. And emergency responders were relying on radio communications because potentially, you know, if you think after a hurricane or a big storm, then power lines could be down, sort of, phone lines could be down, mobile phone masks, things like that. And so they rely on radio communications um, in emergencies. And they reported a complete loss of radio communications during the time that the solar storm was happening. Um, and so that's kind of a secondary implication of space weather as well. So the Aurora is a space weather hazard. Um, now, every few years, the government in the UK makes a list of all the things that they think could impact people in the UK in their daily lives um, and how severe that impact would be. And they kind of rank them on this matrix, this grid, and they list them by the likelihood that something could occur in the next five years, so the, how likely the event is to happen, and also how severe the impact would be if it did happen. So a few of these uh, symbols you might recognize. Uh, one, unfortunately, is the pandemic or a pandemic. Um, so you can see that's very likely to happen. And also, as we know, it would have a severe impact on society. Um, but there are other things. So, for example, extreme cold weather, um, flooding or loss of power or disruptions to electricity supplies. Um, this one down here is a volcano eruption. So 
a few of you might remember a few years ago that um, a volcano erupted in Iceland and the ash cloud that came from that volcano eruption um, closed a lot of UK airspace and we had to ground a lot of UK flights. And so these are sorts of things that could have an impact um, to the UK uh, society. And one that you might notice is this one. So I think it's supposed to be the sun being orbited by planets, um, but it's meant to represent space weather. And so you can see that space weather is quite likely to happen. It's as likely as a pandemic is, but the impact is less severe. So kind of in the middle of the grid here. So we can't prevent space weather. We can't have a big metal shield that, or, you know, made of something um, that would completely block off and um, protect us from the particles and the radiation, because we also rely on the sun for many different things for that support life. So we can't prevent it. So what can we do instead? Well, we can try to predict it the best we can. And so around the time that space weather was added to the National Risk Register, um, the Met Office started to produce these daily space weather forecasts. And so here I've just copied from the Met Office website. And so this is the forecast for today and for the next few days. And this is quite good because usually when I give a talk like this and I'll include a forecast, it usually says, oh, no activity, nothing exciting. Um, but actually today there is something, so that, that's pretty good. Um, and so it says in the headline that there is a chance of minor storm intervals on the 2nd and 4th of December. So that's today and in a few days. Um, chance of moderate solar flares and a possible coronal mass ejection arrival as well. And so they give you kind of a detailed report about what the solar activity has been and what we can expect over the next few days. Um, and they will show you some incredible pictures of the sun in different wavelengths that you would not normally see with, uh, with the human eye. Um, but also you will get your aurora forecast. And so they can tell you whether you can expect to see the northern lights in the next few days. Um, so these forecasts are freely available on the Met Office website if you just search for Met Office space weather. Um, you can find them and keep up to date on all the forecasts, all the space weather activity. And so I suppose when I was talking about the big events, we do get big space weather events, but space weather is happening all the time. And so mostly it's sort of small activity or sometimes we get the occasional big storm or slightly, slightly big impact. Um, but there is some small space weather activity constantly happening. Um, that we just need to be aware of and monitor so that we can try to protect, protect the infrastructure and services that we rely on for day-to-day -day, day -day society relies on. Um, so now that we've kind of covered um, the impact of the Northern Lights, why it's important, why we should care about them, um, maybe now we should move on to how the Northern Lights are actually produced. So I've talked a lot and kind of talked a little bit about how this mostly is driven by solar activity on the sun. And so um, what we do is we put a satellite which sits between the earth and the sun so that we can constantly watch and monitor the activity of the sun. And so here you're seeing um, images from this satellite, and it'll play a little movie in a minute. Um, but the, th the thing is that the sun is so bright, um, so if this satellite was looking at the sun in visible light, which you shouldn't do with your naked eye, but if it was, um, it would see the sun in this tiny little white circle here. But that is so bright that we actually have to put a little cover over the camera so that it could look at the sort of wider part of the sun. And we see this more faint emission and this is the outer atmosphere of the sun, the sort of the solar corona. Um, and it's sort of the outer atmosphere. And this is really where we see solar activity starting and where space weather effects start. So if I play this movie, um, you can start to see that it's extremely dynamic. It's very active. Um, you, this, <laughs> this video is very speeded up, so it's not in real time. 
Um, but you can start to see these huge coronal mass ejections, there's one, and all these solar storms, which throw this energy and radiation out into the, to the sun, uh, sorry, into the solar system. And some of that sometimes is directed towards the Earth. Um, but you can also see that there's just kind of low level variability in the background. And some of what you're seeing there is actually the solar wind. So to look at this in a slightly different way, the sun has this magnetic field. So it's very similar to the Earth's magnetic field. It's a dipole field, just like a bar magnet. And it stretches radially outwards into the solar system. But it is so big and so powerful that it actually spans the entire solar system. So we're all sitting in the sun's magnetic field uh, right now. <laughs> um, so the sun's magnetic field kind of sticks out like this, as if it's got arms. And it's the magnetic field is here. And then the, the charged particles in the sun and in the solar, solar atmosphere get kind of stuck onto the magnetic field lines. So wherever the magnetic field goes, the particles travel with it. And this kind of radial expansion of the magnetic field throughout the solar system carries lots of charged particles and we call it the solar wind. Now, as the sun rotates, then if you can kind of think as I do this, then it actually forms a spiral because the sun is rotating on its axis and it has this radial field and it starts to form the spiral. So this is a model of the solar wind. Um, so we've got the sun in the middle here, and we, this green blob is the Earth, and the two other blobs are just satellites that we um, have also orbiting at the same radius as the Earth. Um, and this plot here shows you the plasma density, so the number of particles per centimeter cubed. And this plot here shows you the plasma velocity or the speed of the plasma of the solar wind. And so if I play this video, this is a model of, it's actually a forecast of the current solar wind um, prediction for today and, and the next few days. And so you can see that we expect towards the fourth, we're expecting to see an increase in the solar wind speed. So potentially a bit of a solar storm impacting or something coming from the sun, some, some activity. Um, and you can see that these solar wind speeds are about four, 450 to 500 kilometers per second. So they're extremely fast. Um, okay, so we've got this constant um, solar wind and magnetic field coming from the sun, and then it interacts, but suddenly it hits the Earth's magnetic field. And the Earth's magnetic field actually does an incredible job of deflecting most of the energy and magnetic field around the Earth. So it's really, really good at protecting us. So when I said we couldn't put up a barrier, um, probably not something that is human made, but we do have a naturally occurring barrier, which is our magnetic field that protects us from a lot of space weather. But you can see that it really impacts the sun's, the Earth's magnetic field, because you, if you look at the sun, uh, sorry, uh, the side of the Earth's magnetic field that is facing the sun is very, very squashed in because it's constantly pushing back against the pressure of the solar wind. So it's constantly having this fight where it's trying to push itself out and the solar wind's pushing back. But then you can see in the other side, on the night side of the Earth, it's got this very stretched out sort of configuration of the magnetic field. So it's very stretched out, kind of like a little squid um, <laughs> in space. And we call this area the magnetotail. So it's the magnetosphere is the magnetic field of the Earth. And the magneto tail is this kind of region um, on the night side of the Earth. And so what happens when the solar wind and the sun's magnetic field comes towards the Earth? Well, we have this kind of constant process which occurs. So the interplanetary magnetic field is the magnetic field of the sun, which is carried by the solar wind. And here we have the Earth's magnetosphere and the, how it's protecting us from most of the solar wind. But as the solar wind comes in and it presses against the um, Earth's magnetic field and it presses and presses and presses until at some point you can only push two magnets together for so long before the magnetic fields just completely reconfigure. 
So as an example, some of these you might remember from school doing experiments where you have bar magnets and you put iron filings down and you can start to see the magnetic field patterns. And so the sun and the earth are just like two dipoles. So say this is the earth and this is the sun. Um, and as the solar wind, or rather, yeah, maybe this is the solar wind because the sun's not moving. Um, and as the solar wind gets closer to the earth, as the magnetic field gets closer, you will see, if I play this, oh, oh, my video is not going to work. Sorry. Oh, there we go. So as the solar wind gets even closer, they can get so close until they suddenly reconfigure. And so you can't keep pushing two magnets together. Suddenly the magnetic field will just restructure and they will form a sort of new configuration. And that's exactly what happens at the sun's, at the day side of the Earth's magnetic field. So these two magnetic fields get closer and closer together until suddenly we get reconnection and the, the whole magnetic field completely restructures. So we get this opening of the field line. Now this field line, the end is still out in the solar wind, which is rushing past at like 500 kilometers per second. So it's really, really fast. And so the end of this field line gets dragged outwards back into, Oh, my pointer's gone again, sorry. So it gets back, dragged backwards again by the solar wind, and then it gets compressed down into the magnetotail on the night side. So there's lots of pressure building up in the magnetotail there. Um, and then this process keeps happening. And at some point, again, you, you get the squeezing of the, of the tail, the magnetic field lines in the tail. And at some point, again, they can only be pushed together so much until they completely reconnect, re reconfigure, and they close. And you get this kind of constant cycle of magnetic field lines opening up, in reverse, opening up and then closing again in the night side tail. And so this whole process is how lots of energy and solar wind particles get transferred from the solar wind and the sun's magnetic field into the Earth's magnetic field. And then they'll, they'll kind of bounce around there, you know, sometimes they'll stay for a while, sometimes um, not so long, but they'll bounce around and sort of uh, orbit around the Earth as well, until at some point they go too far and they might come down the magnetic field line too much and then they'll hit the upper atmosphere. Now we know in the upper atmosphere, it's much more dense than in space. And so they suddenly meet all these oxygen and nitrogen atoms and they collide with them. And then, so depending on which um, type of oxygen or nitrogen that they collide with, they will excite emission and the oxygen or nitrogen particle will release a photon of light. And the wavelength of that light um, will give us a different color of emission that we see. So you can see here that some of the oxygen atoms give us green light. Um, and nitrogen gives us a combination of red and uh, blue light as well, which gives us a kind of purpley color. Um, and so this is how the aurora are actually produced from the sun all the way down to the atmosphere. Okay, so now that we're quite happy with how they're produced and why it's important that we, we know when they're coming, um, how do we actually predict the northern lights? Um, how, how do our current models work? And how good are these predictions at working? And so if you look on the Met Office website on their space weather forecast, um, or many other space weather websites, you'll probably see this model being used or something that's based on this model, which is the Ovation Prime Aurora Forecast Model. And so you can see you can have a projection of the Earth and here you have kind of the top of northern Canada, which you can just see under there. That's um, there. Uh, this is the top of northern Russia. And Europe's here in the UK, maybe just somewhere under here. Can't quite see it. And so this side of the Earth is the day side of the Earth. So you can see it's kind of basked in sunlight. And this side is the night side, so it's a bit darker. And the idea with, the, with this model is that it gives a prediction of the likelihood of the aurora or the northern lights occurring. 
And so the green shows you where um, there is some probability, but a low chance of the aurora being observed. And red shows you where the aurora or the northern lights are quite likely to be observed. And so how this model works is that if you remember, I spoke about the satellites that we have that sit between the sun and the earth, and they can monitor the sun and the activity on the sun. And they also measure the solar wind that's coming in. So the solar wind speed and the density and the strength of the mag magnetic field that's coming towards us. And this gives us some time that we can take the data, run our model, try to predict where the aurora are going to occur, how likely it is that the aurora will occur. And it gives us a forecast for the northern lights in about half an hour. So how potentially strong they could be in 30 minutes time. So it's not that long of a lead time at the moment. Um, but we have also ways to extend that to days as well. But it mostly comes from this kind of, what's the solar wind doing that's going to hit the earth? And what does that mean for the aurora? How can we predict the aurora based on what's coming towards us from the sun? Um, so to evaluate how well these models work, which is a lot of the work that I do at the moment, um, I need an observation to compare this against. And so the aurora observations that I use are actually in the far ultraviolet light. And so we couldn't see this with our um, with our human eyes, but these are taken by satellite images. These are taken by satellites in space, which look down and image or take pictures of the northern lights from space. Um, so again, you can see this map is a bit more difficult, but this is the top of northern Canada and North America that we're looking at here. Uh, Greenland is here, and that's kind of all I can recognize from here, I think. Um, and you can see that this is the day side of the Earth because it's illuminated by ultraviolet light. And we know that the sun gives us ultraviolet light and the atmosphere mostly protects us from that. So that is actually the UV light hitting the atmosphere. And then this is the night side of the earth facing away from the sun. And so if I play this movie, you will see that the northern lights are very active. Again, this is very speeded up as well. They're quite active, they're quite dynamic. But you'll notice that they kind of form this ring around the North Pole. So this forms a ring around the magnetic, oops, but play it again. Um, forms this ring around the magnetic pole of the Earth. Um, and so if we take snapshots of that from these kind of satellite images, we'll get something like this. So we center the image on the North Pole, on the magnetic North Pole. Um, and you can see again, this is the day side of the Earth because it's extremely saturated our camera from all the UV light from the sun. So that's day side. And then this is the night side of the Earth. And you'll see how the aurora forms this really nice ring of emission in the night side. And what I use, the data that I use, is we estimate where the sort of the extent of the aurora is. So we try to basically draw a line of where the aurora stops. So it's bright in here, and then it stops here, and it stops down here. And we call these the auroral boundaries. So this is the poleward auroral boundary, so the edge of the emission, which is close to the pole. And this is the edge of the emission, which is close to the equator. So it's the equatorward auroral boundary. And so when I evaluate the auroral forecast model, I essentially just take my aurora forecast from the model. I compare it with what was observed at the same time as was forecast by the aurora, uh, sorry, by the observations. And I compare these two against each other. And so on this map, again, you've got the day side is up here. So that's facing the sun. And then you've got the night side around here. And the gray region shows where the model is not predicting any aurora will occur. So there's a 0% chance of aurora from the model in, in, these, uh, in most of these areas. And then the colors show where the model thinks that the aurora will occur. And so it's showing the kind of the likelihood that the aurora will occur there. 
And then the black lines are showing the observed auroral boundaries that we get from these observations. So I'm going to take you through a very quick bit of maths, but it's very easy, so don't worry, um, about how we compare each of the forecasts. So if I have my map of the aurora and my observations as well, in each square, I can evaluate whether the aurora was observed. I can say, was the aurora forecast? And also, was it observed? So if I take this first point A, um, was the aurora forecast? Well, yes, because the probability is higher than zero. So the likelihood of the aurora occurring is higher than zero. So the model is forecasting that something that the northern lights will, will be will occur here, will be visible here. Um, and was the aurora observed in that region? Also, yes. So if it's between these two black lines, then that's where the aurora was observed. So yes, the aurora was observed and forecast. And so that is a correct forecast, that's a hit. Um, if I take us another region, uh, was the aurora forecast here? Well, yes, again, because it has a higher um, than zero likelihood that the aurora will occur. Um, however, did the was the aurora observed there? It's outside of these two black lines. It's poleward of these two black lines. So no, it wasn't observed there. And so that would be a false alarm forecast. Um, another point here. If the aurora uh, was the aurora observed, sorry, was the aurora forecast there? And no, it wasn't because this gray indicates a zero percent chance of the aurora as forecast by the model. But was the aurora observed there? Yes, because it's between these two black lines. So yes, it was observed. So that's the time where the forecast actually missed the aurora in that region. And finally, in this point. Um, was the aurora forecast? No, it wasn't because it's gray. Um, and was it observed? No, it wasn't because it's outside of these two lines. So the, mod the model is correctly forecasting that no northern lights will occur there. So we just do this and we can build up a picture of how well our model is predicting the aurora in each, um, in each box. And this was actually some work done by a group of students at St. Richard Reynolds Catholic College in Twickenham, who worked with me and helped me to do my research on this. And so they did the same analysis that I've just gone through for lots of different um, maps. It was about two and a half years worth of maps. But don't worry, I gave them a computer program that we worked on um, so they didn't have to go through them all by hand. Um, and in this, we just essentially, it shows us how well our model is performing in different regions. And so um, blue indicates good model performance. So where the um, map shows blue, that's good model. So models performing well. Um, and red is where the model is not performing so well. Um, the black lines show the observed auroral boundaries on average. So the average location of the observed auroral boundaries. Um, and again, it's in the same orientation. So this is the day side um, of the map and this is the night side of the map here. And so we can see that we have this area um, where we get poor model performance, where the model doesn't predict the Northern Lights very well in this region. And so why is that? Why is that happening? And the answer I think is auroral substorms. And so these are a type of auroral phenomena that we've known about since, or we've really been studying um, in a lot of detail since about the 1960s. Um, and we know quite a lot about auroral substorms, but not a huge amount. And so auroral substorms, um, again, these are images taken by a satellite. So similar to the video that I showed you earlier. And, um, but these are just like snapshots in time. So time is increasing in this direction along if you follow the rows. Um, and what you will see is that there's this very localized, really bright region in the aurora that occurs. And then that brightness spreads in both directions, east and west. And it spreads around and it gets really bright and really active for a while. And then the activity kind of just decays and it moves around and kind of dies away again. Um, 
But the thing with the remote substorms is that they're not caused by the solar wind. It's sort of a process which was just happening inside the Earth's magnetosphere in the magneto tail, where there's a huge amount, suddenly a huge amount of reconnection in the magneto tail that sends loads of particles down into the atmosphere that then cause this very localized brightening in the aurora that we see. And so it's very difficult to predict. We don't understand when a substorm is going to occur or why they occur because it's happening in the magneto tail and not in the solar wind. And so we, we don't have that kind of um, forecast ahead to know what's coming. Um, we don't know when it's going to happen. And so that's really why we're getting that poor performance in, um, in the night side of the model. Um, and just to show you that these are some original hand-drawn images of what a substorm looks like from, from the ground. So this was just an observer who was trying to under who sort of saw this sequence of events of substorms and was trying to understand what was happening in the Earth's magnetic field um, back in 1964. So these are a very famous set of diagrams. And they're actually, now that we see them with a the satellite, they're extremely true to life. So it's very impressive. Um, and just to finish up, um, you can actually see a substorm in this video that I showed you earlier. And so I think. If I go back to a pointer. Um, oh, sorry. Um, you see a bright there. That's brightness occurring just there. Uh, for some reason, I can't find the uh, the thing in the video to go back and forth. Oh, there it is. Um. Oh, that was never mind. Um. Okay, I'll just point with my pointer, not there. So it appears about here in a second. There you go. There's the initial brightening, and you can see that it's spread around the whole rural oval. And so these substorms are happening all the time, but we just don't really understand why they occur, when they occur. And that's really having um, an impact on how well we're able to predict the northern lights uh, in this space. So can we predict the northern lights? Um, yes, we can but our models are still not quite perfect. And there's a lot that we don't fully understand um, about the Earth's magnetic fields and about substorms in particular. So we don't understand why they happen or when they will happen. Um, however, we do have an exciting um, new satellite mission coming up, which is called the Solar Wind Magnetosphere Ionosphere Link Explorer, or we call it SMILE for short. Um, and the SMILE mission is a joint um, collaboration between the European Space Agency and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So it's a really special mission, and it's going to go into this very highly elliptical, very distant orbit. And the reason it's up there is so that it can look down and it will look at the day side of the Earth's magnetic field here and observe that in X-ray emission to try to see where uh, magnetic reconnection is occurring and the reconfiguration of the field. And then it will also look at the aurora in the northern hemisphere simultaneously, so we can try to understand the interaction with the solar wind and coronal mass ejections and kind of geomagnetic substorms as well. So hopefully we'll get more of an understanding of the dynamics of the magnetosphere and a better understanding of why and when substorms occur. Um, if you would like to get more involved with uh, Aurora or Northern Light searching and things like this, you can sign up to many different apps. So Aurora Watch UK will send you an alert if the Aurora is visible in your area. And you can also report when you've seen the Aurora with things like Aurora Saurus and projects like that. Um, and as I mentioned, if you want an even more in-depth space rather report daily that you can read and um, you can get that from the my office or there are similar um, reports available from other um, places in, in the US as well. And finally, finally, um, if you want to get more involved in a rural science projects, then there are a number of citizen science projects that you can get involved with. And so these are mostly kind of 
Um, they're really fun and <laughs> they don't take too much time. Um, but you can click through auroral images and a lot of them are identifying different auroral morphologies and structures and trying to see and categorize different types of aurora that we can see in our image data. And it, it really goes towards a real science project. So we'd be really helping science in general. So um, that is everything from me. And I would like to thank you all for coming and thank you to the Royal Observatory for hosting this seminar series as well. <laughs>